God will defend his people in chapter 9. God is going to defend his people at Armageddon. And in chapter 9, if you remember, we saw the first coming of Jesus. I'm going to read that again because I want to tie this up before we get into 10, which is it's very important that we tie it up, so bear with me. Chapter 9, reviewing a little bit. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king cometh unto you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass. Now, this is the prophetic thing that Jesus did in Matthew 21. And it says to Israel, this is your king riding on an ass. Oh, they just couldn't believe such a thing. That, you know, and it says he would come lowly, but he would have salvation. Why? Because he must go to the cross. He must be their sacrifice. He must be their servant. He must humble himself to go to the cross. All they can think is king, 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 king. And he is the king, but the king had to take the cross before the king could take the crown. Then in verses 10 and 11, it had the second coming. But see, they lumped it all together. And that's why they refused him. And we looked at Psalms 118, saw the same pattern. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and dominion, his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Now, when he comes back at his second coming, he will come at Armageddon and absolutely stop the destruction of the Jews. And it says here, he will cut off the battle bow and bring peace, and he will take dominion. Woo. As for thee... Also, by the blood of the covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Because of my covenant with the Jewish nation, I have come, and when there was no way out, I've dug you out of the pit, and I have come as your Savior. So, see, they refused him going to the cross, but he had to go to the cross before he could come as their king, which he will come, and they will look on him whom they fear. Zechariah tells us later, this news gets better. You know, but this is that two time coming that they lumped as one and didn't compare scripture with scripture and know the whole revelation. Then he goes in to description in verses 12 through 17 of chapter 9 how he will fight for them at Armageddon. There is no way they can come out of it. It will take the appearing of Jesus Christ and his fighting for them. So he says that Turn you to the stronghold ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee Turn to me. I want to be your stronghold. When I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with the whirlwinds of the south. Remember how it talks about when he returns, there will be the blowing of the trumpet? What kind of a trumpet is this anyway? Honey, this is the trumpet of victory. Old Testament, when they marched around the walls of Jericho, they didn't say anything. They just had those little shofar trumpets blowing them, which is always the sound of victory. You can see the trumpet was used over and over and over and over and over and over through the Old Testament, the sound of victory. And when that trumpet blows, and it blows from heaven, the Jews are going to say, victory for us looks like we're the most defeated. But Jesus is going to blow the trumpet of victory for them. The Lord of hosts shall defend them. And they shall devour and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as though wine, and they shall be filled like bowls and as the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day, the flock of his people. For they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. I tell you, he will do such a miracle and make them shine before their enemy. And remember, that will be all of that enemy and all those nations of the Antichrist that come around there to fight. And Armageddon will come right on into Jerusalem. See, it is a valley, and it, the valley of Jehoshaphat, and it will come right on down into Jerusalem. And blood will flow so heavily. It will be a terrible time. But the Lord will come as their king. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. He will not only defend them, but he will bring prosperity to them. Corn always has to do with prosperity, and new wine has to do with celebration. And they will celebrate the Lord and see that he is their Messiah. Now, as we go on in this book, it even gets clearer, because remember, it's a 14-chapter book. Now we're going to go to chapter 10. And see, the, I told you the end part of this book, the first part of the book, we saw the 10 visions, which had mostly to do with stirring them up, getting them to finish the temple. But the last part of the book 
has to do with prophecies about Jesus Christ and how he will come and what God will do to their enemies. Now, chapter 10, I love this early part because it tells you what to do as a nation when times are tough and rough. It says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give more showers of rain to everyone, grass in the field. Now, he said, when you hit these tough times, what should you do? You should ask for rain in the time of latter rain. Do you know this scripture is quoted and quoted and quoted? I was looking at all the places it's quoted. It's quoted in Hosea 6.3. It's quoted in Joel 2.23-32. And it's quoted in James 5.7. So he's saying, when times get tough, what should you do? Ask for God to pour out His Spirit. Folks, that's the only thing that can save our nation. I mean the only thing. It's the only thing that can save your family is for God to pour out His Spirit upon your family. It's the only thing that can save our cities. It's the only thing that can save the nations of the world is to ask for rain in the time of latter rain. You say, is this the time of latter rain? No question, it is. Because he said he would pour out the former rain. That happened on Pentecost. But in the end time, he would pour out his former and latter rain. We should be getting double outpouring. But folks, you get it by asking. And too many times, we don't ask. You know, when Elijah wanted the rain to be poured out on his people, he didn't just say, well, I've called the fire down. Forget that. No, he didn't. He knew what came after this, the people had repented, was rain. But he prayed God's word. So he went up and prayed. And it didn't say he got an answer the first thing. It said he just kept praying and sending this little boy out to look. And the little boy servant kept coming back seven times. And finally he said, well, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. And jumped in a chariot. And the rain came. I mean, it burst upon that place and rained and rained and rained and rained. But somebody asked. Somebody asked. And we need to quit whining around about what goes wrong in our nation and in the world and ask. And this is one of the reasons why I love to encourage you to read through the Bible with me because we pray every day for a nation and its leader. And we ask for the outpouring of the Spirit on nations and leaders of the world. And you know, folks, I'm going to tell, tell you something that I know I've done and many others, but it has really encouraged me recently about praying for nations and leaders. I have prayed that communism would be put to confusion, and I have named the countries, East Germany, Hungary, Romania, Yugoslavia, the whole schmear, Albania, North Korea, all those countries, Soviet Union, China. I've prayed them specifically, Cuba. And you know, that is specifically what is happening. You say... You prayed for that. I prayed for that. You say, do you think this is part of your uh, answer to your prayers? Of course I think it. Because it is not God's will for those countries to be communistic, anti-God. No, in no way. Does prayer make a difference? Yes, it makes a difference or he wouldn't tell you to ask for it. So what do we need for our nation? We need a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We as people need to pray it every day. Every day, God's in an outpouring on this nation. God's in an outpouring. When I hear the news and I get up early in the morning and get world news, I take it not so I'll know news, but so I can pray over that news. You know, some of it is, most of it is bad news, but we can pray the good news. He said, ask for it. And this is the time of the former and the latter reign. And I don't want just these nations not to have a communistic government. I want them to have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want these people to get saved. And you do too. So he's saying, ask. Then he says to them, for the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. We turn to all kinds of things to try and get some comfort and strength to help our nation. So they can't help you. Only asking for God's reign. You know, we're looking now in 10, chapter 10 of Zechariah at verse 2. For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. And the idols here are teraphim, T-E-R-A-P-H-I-M. And these are the kind of idols that were considered good luck charms. They weren't some big idol that they bowed down and worshipped. They were little things you could carry in your hand. They would probably be about the size of this earring. And so they would carry that in their hand. This is my little good luck charm. You know, wait. You may have done it as a kid, stupid thing, but they do it all over the world as little charms. Do you remember when Rachel stole her father's teraphim when, when they fled? I think 
Now, this is just an opinion because I don't think the Bible tells you clearly enough. I think she did not want her father talking to those little tiny idols and trying to put a curse on their flight. And so she grabbed off the idols, you know, and so when he came after them, he was looking for his idols and she lied about it and hid them and didn't give them to him. But those were those little kind of teraphim. Now, what did Israel do? Judah and Israel, before their captivities, had all kinds of idolatry, worship. And so they'd get these little tiny idols, little tiny things, and they would just worship them and rub them, and this is supposed to bring good luck. And sometimes they would set them up in their homes, just set them up someplace, and put food in front of them. Stupidest thing. And in Psalms, it says an idol doesn't have eyes that can see or ears that can hear or a mouth that can speak. Idols won't answer you. Only God will answer you. And it said people who worship these idols become like these idols. And that is exactly right. And Corinthians tells us that behind all idols is demonic activity. Satan is behind it. Ooh, that is really bad news. And so when we worship idols or in anything make an idol of it in our lives, we are bringing satanic activity in. And what does it do? It deceives us. It blinds us. We don't hear clearly. It causes us that we cannot hear. We don't see clearly. It causes us that we do not hear clearly and we cannot speak the truth. And deception comes very gradually, very gradually, because if it just came real big, you wouldn't receive it. I mean, the devil's smarter than that. So gradually they were deceived. They said, oh, if we have these idols, they will bring rain. If we worship these idols, they will cause us to have children. And so that's why this idolatry thing is so heavy duty. And they went into captivity over to idolatry. And so he is saying, wait a minute, don't get into that. He said, because there's no answer for you. And he said, look what it, it led to. It led into captivity, total confusion, because they didn't have the true shepherd, the living shepherd. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds and punished the goats, for the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Now, I, wanted to, I want to go into that because Zechariah is referring back to why they had to go into captivity to start with. He said, because of the shepherds and the goats, the sheep and the goats, my people went into captivity. See, they worshiped those little dumb teraphim that they carried around their hand and rubbed all the time and put food in front of and said, this can save us. Well, no idol can save you because it has, for one thing, it has demonic activity behind it. The devil never saved you from anything. He just put you into bondage. He can't take you out. Another thing, they can't talk to you, they can't hear, they can't see, and they cause you to act the same way. So they went into bondage, and God blamed two groups of people for it. He blamed sheep, and he blamed goats. Who are the sheep? The false shepherds of that day. The false shepherds, the priests, got into all kinds of demonic activity. You can read about it in Jeremiah. It was pitiful what they got into and led the people into. The goats are the nations that rose up and came against them. And they are the ones who were not their shepherds, but were goats that came to destroy the sheep. And that would be like Nebuchadnezzar and the nations, Assyria, that came against them. So God is saying, hey, I'm against these for what they have done. And they have taken my flock. They've taken my flock. And in the New Testament, it says that if you are going to feed the flock of God, you know, that you dwell among, and you are given the oversight thereof, you're not to do it for filthy lucre's sake, and you're not to do it by constraint, but of a ready mind and willingly. Then it says, not being lords over God's heritage, but as examples to the flock. You know, if we as leaders, no, no matter where you may be a leader, if you can always remember that you are there to feed the flock of God, never to be, I'm your head, I'm to keep you in line. Oh, no. You're to be an example of how to live in line. That's heavy duty in leadership. When I think as a pastor's wife, I'm supposed to be setting an example for our people. You know, not just telling them what they ought to be doing, but living with what they ought to be doing. That is too hard in the natural. But if God called you to do it and you allow him to do it through you, it is not too hard in the supernatural. And so this is what he's dealing with. Then he says, out of him, and this is one of the most exciting verses in the whole Bible, but out of him, out of Judah, came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. 
Now he said, though they didn't have the right shepherds, and though the goats came down there and took them, out of Judah, something is coming. What is it? The corner. Oh, you know who the corner is. He is the cornerstone, right? First Peter talks and talks and talks about it. Said the stone, which was disregarded of man, has become the head of the corner. And said he is elect and precious in the sight of God. And first Peter goes over and over and over the cornerstone. And then says, we also are lively stones built up a spiritual house. Oh, a holy priesthood, a nation, a peculiar people. And we are the lively stones. Why? Because we're a chip off the old block, off of Jesus, that head of the corner. We become a lively stone. So he said, out of them, though, is going to come Jesus, the cornerstone. Oh, that's the stone that unites the building, puts it together, the Jew and the Gentile. But it says something else about him. Out of him came the nail. You know, in this day, we say, who can I trust? You know, we see on the news, bad news about Christians who have fallen. We hear about a pastor falling. We hear about some other Christian who's backslidden. Oh, we hear about somebody that got into false doctrine. We say, well, where can you have confidence? Folks, you can have confidence in Jesus. People are going to fail. People are going to fail. Their words are going to fail. Their lifestyle is not always going to be right. But Jesus is the one that we can hang everything on. And I can hang it on his word and put my confidence in him. So it's saying, they, he is really saying, you know, you put your confidence in the teraphim. You put your confidence in diviners who, uh, you know, had dreams and, and would cut animals open and take their entrails out and throw them in a little pot. And the way the entrail fell, that was what was supposed to happen to them. Ugh, say yuck three times. Yuck, yuck, yuck. And he says, see, these didn't have any answer for you. But oh, the cornerstone, he's got the answer. The peg, the nail, you can hang your life on him. It'll never be wrong. And he is what? Your battle bow. He will fight for you and bring you through. And see, when the Jews seize Jesus, when he comes back, they will look on him whom they have pierced, but they will realize he is the cornerstone that they rejected. They will realize that they can hang everything on him. He is their Messiah. And when he comes back and fights for them and defeats the Antichrist and all of the nations and the armies around there, they will say, truly, he is our battle bow, and he has taken care of our oppressors. And they shall be as mighty men which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be confounded. When he appears, it will give them new hope, and they will begin to fight too, because they will see who their true cornerstone is. So this cornerstone, this peg, this battle bow, is really the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Jews. See, remember I told you at the beginning, Zechariah is the book, the prophetic book that in particular deals with the dealing of Jesus Christ with the natural Jew. So when they see him, that he is the one, they really get together and begin to fight. And I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. Two houses here that he is going to deal with. Two houses. And I just have a little tiny bit of time, but don't miss this next session. Remember, Joseph is the ten tribes to the north. That is the northern kingdom. Judah are the two tribes to the south. Those two tribes had a split and a division. But he said, when I come back, I will bring them together. I will call them, and they will come together as one. God had never wanted his people divided. He's always wanted his people united. The devil wants us divided. Then we don't accomplish much. We just fight each other instead of fighting the good fight of faith. And that's exactly what he wants. And we're so stupid we fall into it. But Jesus is going to come as the uniter. The blood of Jesus reconciles things in heaven, and the blood of Jesus reconciles things on earth. It will unite the Jews. And everyone has said the hardest people to get united are the Jews. They fight among themselves just terribly. But Jesus will unite them. See, because his blood can reconcile. Now today we're going to look at chapter 10, and we're going to finish it. And we're going to see the tremendous promise that God gave to these dispersed Jews. You see, these Jewish people were outcasts. They had been in slavery for 70 years. But we have to go back and kind of review a little bit that the ten tribes to the north, you know, they had a division at the time of Solomon's death. Solomon got involved with idolatry. Uh, when he married these heathen women, they began to turn his 
heart toward idolatry. I believe he repented of it because of what the book of Ecclesiastes tells us. But God told him, said, when you die, the kingdom will be t divided. And ten tribes will go to the north, but two will stay in the south. They will be called Judah. The northern kingdom will be called Ephraim or Israel or sometimes even Joseph. The southern kingdom would just be called the southern kingdom or Judah. But he said it will divide. So at the time of Solomon's death, Rehoboam, his son, took the throne. And he took some bad counsel and told the people, I'm going to pressure you. I'm going to tax you worse than my father ever did. And when he said that, he had no relationship with the people. And you know, rules without relationship bring rebellion. And I mean, the people rebelled and said, we don't want you as a king. And they took Jeroboam as their king. And God had selected him as the man. But Jeroboam did not stay true to God, led the northern kingdom into idolatry, built a golden calf at Dan and Bethel. And you know, he'd been down in Egypt for a while. And you know, it seemed like any time Israelites got involved with Egyptians, they got involved with golden calves. Remember Aaron? He built one. And so he built this golden calf, start two golden calves, started a new priesthood, and called the people to worship those golden calves. God was so turned off and so disgusted with it. And he sent prophet after prophet after prophet in the five cycles of discipline in Leviticus 26, calling them to repentance. But in 215 years, folks, there never was a good king. Never was. And Elijah called them to repentance. Elisha called them to repentance. Prophets were sent, wonderful prophets. And the people would repent, you know, for periods of time. But on the whole, they were ungodly. And finally, God said, it's enough. Took them into captivity to Assyria. So they owned their kingdom. The northern kingdom only lasted 215 years. Then the southern kingdom lasted 468 years because though they had some bad kings, out of 19 kings, nine of their kings were good. So they lasted double the time of the northern kingdom because of the godly kings that they had there. But finally, after the death of Josiah, the last good king of the southern kingdom, when his sons took the throne, they just turned from God. And the whole thing began to go downhill. Jehoahash, uh, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. It just went down, 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 down. And they got into idolatry till they, according to the fifth cycle of discipline, Leviticus 26, went in captivity to Babylon. Now take your hands, say bye-bye, northern kingdom. You say, why do you have me do this? Because it will help you remember. You say it's childish. It's good for you to act like a child. Say bye-bye, northern kingdom. You went into captivity to Assyria. Okay, did you do it? Now, take your hands and wave again. You say, oh, not again. Yes, again. Say, bye-bye, Judah. You went in captivity to Babylon. Now, when the northern kingdom went into captivity, we really don't hear much more about them. But the southern kingdom, God told them through Jeremiah that they would come back in 70 years. They had not kept the land Sabbaths. Every seven years, they were to let the land rest. God said he would so bless them in the sixth year, he would triple the increase of their crops. Wow, folks, that's quite a promise. But they got all nervous, fearful, and greedy, and said, oh, we better work, work the seventh year. So for 490 years, they hadn't kept a land Sabbath. So God said, you won't keep them? Then I'll just take you off and keep them for myself. So seven into 490 is 70 years. It tells us this at the end of 2 Chronicles. So I want you to know this is Bible, not something I'm just making up. So he took them, those 70 Sabbaths, out of the land, kept them at Babylon. Now they're back. He's encouraging them to refinish, to refinish, to finish the temple. So when he starts he, here, he gives some promises for Judah and Joseph, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom and indicates they're all going to come back and be blessed. Now, you know, that probably seems so far out to them. They thought, well, where will you find them? They've been scattered for years by the Assyrian army, you know, by the Assyrian nation. Over 200 years, they've been scattered abroad. But God said he's going to bring them back and make them as one. So this is the gorgeous promise that was given to them that they so appreciated. And I will strengthen the house of Judah that's southern kingdom. And I will save the house of Joseph, that's northern kingdom, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off. So he said, it isn't just Judah that's going to come back, but I'm going to bring Joseph back too. 
I'm going to bring them back, and I'm going to treat them so well, it will as be as though they were never led into captivity. Isn't God a merciful God? <laughs> then he said, And they of Ephraim, that's Joseph, or Northern Kingdom, that was another name for them, shall be like a mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as the, through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. He said, I tell you, they're going to get so happy. They're going to celebrate me so much that it will just be unbelievable what's going to happen. Now you say, well, how is he going to get them back? Because I'm sure that's what they thought. How on earth is he going to do this? And this is what he says. I will hiss for them. <sighs> what is a hiss? I don't know if I did it right. Would you go S -s -s -s? Anyway, he said, I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. So God said, I'm going to call them back. I'll put it in their hearts, and they'll come from the north, and they'll come from the south, they'll come from the east, they'll come from the west, and in their hearts, I will just pull them in by the Spirit. Inside, they'll just say, I want to go back, I want to go back, I want to go back. Does God know how to bring his people back? Oh, yes, God knows how to bring his people back. And he said, and I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children and turn again. And folks, that, this has been happening for some time. People have been coming back from Russia, from Germany, from all over the world. I mean, when you visit Israel, it's populated by Jews from all over the world. There are Jews from Ethiopia, remember called the Falashas. They came in there. They were almost spirited out of Ethiopia. They had such an unusual thing. The way they got them out of there is a miracle terribly persecuted by the Ethiopians, the communist Ethiopians. And a man went in there like he was a Jewish man, like he was going to dig wells for them, and some way got planes in them and took them out and took them back to Israel. And the Falashas are back in Israel. And I'm sure there are hundreds of unusual, miraculous ways that God brought his people back, put the desire in them, hissed for them, and then made the means for them to get there. And so he said, they will come back. I'll hiss for them. I'll sow them. And I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, and place shall not be found for them. He said, I'm going to bring so many of them that Israel won't be big enough to take care of them. And we see that Israel will expand. Now, you may not like all the things I'm going to tell you, but it indicates they will expand into Lebanon and into Syria and into Jordan because there will be so many Jews that come back that they will take on that extra land. Now see, right now we've got a big fight with the Arabs and the Jews. You say, how will this thing ever end? God will end it, and God knows how. It isn't our duty to worry or always figure it out, but it is our position to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction, and shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the deeps of the river shall dry up. And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And, of course, we see where God is going to dry up some rivers to, in order to bring his people down, and he'll bring some armies down against them, too, or some armies will come down against them. He won't bring them, but they will come on their own. And he said, it will be hard, and they will come out through affliction. It will be difficult, but I'll get them back. And then he closes and says, And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. They will see that I'm the one that has done this. Their strength will come from me, because they won't have it from anybody else. Nations will hate them. But I will be the one, and I will do it in my name. Because, you see, name has to do with covenant. And they are still his covenant people. Who is the Jew? Why is the Jew so important to God? Why would God make the Jew the receptacle of his word and really the means that he would bring forth the Messiah who would be for the world? Why would he give the word to the world through the Jew? Why would he do that? The Jew probably is the greatest sign of God's word being true of anything that, is, that we can see with our natural eye. Why isn't the Jew wiped out by now? He's been scattered every place. Why is he still around? N nobody else is. If you were to say, well, I'm going to look for the descendants of Esau. They were called Edomites. They were called Idumeans in the New Testament. You can go around and ask people, are you an Idumean? Are you an Edomite? Are you a descendant of Esau? They say, are you crazy? But if you say, are you a Jew? They may say, yes. That's right. Isn't that right? The Jews are still here. Why is it the Edomites are gone, the descendants of Esau, and the Jews are still here? You say, well, they're God's promised people. And God said, it wasn't because you were mighty or wonderful or spiritual I chose you, or big. 
and really you were the least. And God in his great wisdom saw fit. But I want to break down the Jews a little bit here because I think it will help us as we go on into our next chapter on our next session. There are basically three uh, breakdowns here with the Jews, three biblical concepts of Jews. We have the natural Jew, who is, he is born a Jew, racially he is a Jew, or culturally, or whatever you want to say, ethnically, he is a Jew. He's born that. Didn't choose it, just born that, Jewish family. Then there is religious Israel. What is this? These are those who say, I'm a Jew, and are very legalistic. And Jesus condemned religious Israel. Then there is regenerate Israel, those who accept Christ as their Savior. And these are the grace Jews, the believing Jews. And of course, many of them were saved when you read in the book of Acts. Many, many, many. The first revival was among the Jews. So you say, well, that was kind of a nation within a nation. That's right. So when we start looking at the Jews, we look at the native, you know, the natural Jew. We look at the religious Jew, and then we look at the spiritual Jew, the born-again Jew, which there were some. Now, that kind of helps us. Now, when God brings them back, he always talks in these prophets, doom and gloom to the nations who persecuted them. And I thought, we just <clears throat> kind of go through a little bit of this to give you a background of it of the history of the Jews. The Chaldean Empire, the Assyrian Empire, both persecuted the Jews terribly. See, the Assyrian Empire, remember we waved goodbye to the Assyrian Empire, or no, to the Northern Kingdom because they were taken by the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was terribly cruel to the Jews, terribly cruel. God sent them Jonah, and Jonah preached to them, and they repented. But over a hundred years later, the next generations did not repent and stay true to God. And God sent them Nahum. And Nahum said God's vengeance would come upon them and they would fall. So God judged Assyria by their treatment of his people, the Jews. Isn't that something? Then Babylon comes in, conquers Assyria, comes in, takes the southern kingdom. Now Judah, remember when we waved bye-bye Judah? Takes them into captivity. And what does God do? Then at the end of 70 years, he begins to judge Babylon. That's right, and sends the Medo-Persian Empire against them. So you see, the way people treated God's people was the way God dealt with them. The Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians basically were good to the Jews. Cyrus, the first king, signed the decree that they could go back and rebuild their land, rebuild their temple. Darius, another Persian king, gave them the money to finish the temple. And so we see here that God blessed the Medo-Persian Empire. You know, the devil tried to cook up a way so he could kill all the Jews in the Medo-Persian Empire. But if you remember, Mordecai and Esther prayed the thing through and fasted and stepped in and they were saved. You see, the devil's plan is always to kill the Jew. Why was it so strong in the Old Testament? Because he knew if he killed off the Jews, there would be no Messiah because the Messiah had to come through the Jews. Folks, let's don't just look at surfacey things. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to show us what is really behind this and then go for the devil's throat. It was the devil that wanted to kill them. You know, we said, well, Haman, he was just jealous of Mordecai. The devil used Haman through a sin, you know, like that. But actually, the big plot was the devil trying to wipe out the Jews, and he didn't get away with it because a man and a woman stood in the gap for them, and it didn't happen. But as a whole, the Medo-Persian Empire was very, very blessed. They were good to the Jews. Well, the next empire that arises is Greece. My, my. Greece, we studied how Alexander the Great took his whole empire by the time he was 27 years old, was a genius, taught his people one language. See, the nation of Greece had always been divided because all these little segments of Greeks spoke their own language, and he put literally a language together that united his nation and took them out to war and conquered nation after nation after nation, absolutely took the Medo-Persian Empire and was going to go into Jerusalem and take Israel, except that he had a dream before it happened, and saw this priest coming out with a scroll. And God said, don't touch them, they're my people. And so when he came around, Jerusalem was going to take it, brought his army. God spoke to this priest and said, walk out there with the scroll, and I will save you. And he walked out with the scroll, and when Alexander saw him, he said, oh, I don't want to hurt you. You know, you're... 
your God is the right God and went in and literally worshiped with them. And you know, it is said in history that he took many Jews and made them administrators throughout his whole empire. And of course they were, were and are a very talented people. So what did God do with Greece? They were blessed for a long time because of the behavior of Alexander the Great toward the Jews. They are his people, they're covenant people. Then when Rome came on the scene, and conquered Greece, Rome was not good to the Jews. They were not. They oppressed them terribly and were a part of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And the Jews hated them, despised them. Now what happened to the Roman Empire? They were cruel to God's people. And is there a Roman Empire around today? No, there's no Roman Empire. And it wasn't another nation that took them, but they became so corrupt from within that finally they fell from their own inner corruptions. Though God had many believers in Rome testifying and witnessing, beautiful believers, Paul was one of them. Luke was one of them. Peter was one of them. So they had a lot of light, but they turned back the light. And you will find with every nation, God brings them light. What they do with that light, they, they make the choice because God makes us with a free will. Rome was destroyed. Spain. You know, Spain was a tremendous nation at one time. I mean, they conquered a big part of the world with their navy. No, 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 the Spanish Armada, big time. But you know, Spain killed Christians and killed Jews. Yes, they killed both of them. The Spanish Inquisition is hideous. If you read about that, it's unbelievable, the cruelty to the Jews. Spain lost her position as a world power. Why? I believe part of it was her treatment of the Jews. Let's go on, that's not all. Then we see after Spain, Great Britain. When Spain began to go down the drain, Great Britain began to rise up and become a world power. But Great Britain was good to the Jew. The Magna Carta was the first actual document of protection that, had, that dealt with the Jew also. And so what did God do? For years, God blessed Great Britain as a world power. Great Britain was good to his people. What about the Third Reich, Germany? They are embarrassed to this day for what they did to the Jews. Oh, what they did to the Jews, it is so terrible. Why? Because God said, these are my people. The cruelty, they say over six million Jews were murdered by the Third Reich. Where is the Third Reich? You know, there is no Third Reich. And Germany went through terrible, terrible things because of their treatment of the Jews. Folks, God's saying he's going to hiss for them and he's going to bring them back. You can say, but they don't know Jesus. No, they don't, but they will. And God st still says they are his covenant people. And he says in Romans that if the falling away of them brought in the Gentile, what will the coming back of them be? And so his promises to them are wonderful. And then he said he will bless those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I believe, folks, whether they want to believe in Jesus or not, we must pray for them. You know, I, I witness to them. I live basically in a Jewish neighborhood, and I can't tell you that they're open to the gospel. They're sweet, and they're precious, and they're wonderful, and I love them. But I haven't found them to be very open. Some are opening up, but God still says we're to be good to his people because we are basically Judeo-Christians. We take the Old and the New Testament together. So we have that heritage. We can't just throw it out the window and say it isn't there. Honey, it's there. 39 books of it are there, and we're studying them. So let's be a blessing to the Jew and not a curse. Let's pray for them that they will know Jesus, that the blind will drop from their eyes, that they will see the new covenant. They're afraid of us as believers because they say all Christians ever did kill us. See, they say the Germans that killed them were Christians. They weren't Christians, but that's what they think because they think all Gentiles are Christians. Sometimes I read the paper, I think I'm almost reading Matthew 24 with some of the things that are going on. It, you know, I listen to the news early in the morning and it amazes me how it is all dovetailing with the Bible. And I am not claiming in any way to be a big, big scholar of prophecy, 
But I think just being a reader of the Bible helps you to understand prophecy, and that's where you and I are, right? Right. Okay. Let's look at chapter 11. Now, when you open this chapter, you find out that it begins to deal with the captivity and its administration, and, of course, the judgment that came upon them. But it breaks into three segments. And in the chapter, verses 1 through 11 deals with the false shepherds and the apostate leaders of Judah. It's really pitiful how the leadership, the spiritual leadership, I shouldn't call them spiritual, religious leadership, sold them out. Then in verses 12 through 14, thank God we have the good shepherd. And they rejected him. And who is the good shepherd? This is Jesus Christ. And we're going to see his staffs today. Oh, it's really dynamite. You'll like it. And then in verses 15 through 17 in this same chapter, we will see the idle shepherd who is the Antichrist. And he will catch the Jews. And for a while they will be deceived by him. And so we're going to do some contrasts with shepherds that are men, you know, just shepherds that are people on the earth that sell out their people. We're going to see the wonderful shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're going to see the Antichrist, the false shepherd. And we're going to see the contrast. Now, folks, all of us have had people who were in leadership, and I'm talking about religious leadership and spiritual leadership, that probably failed us in some way or another. You know, I'm a pastor's wife. I'm sure I've failed people. I know I have. There ain't any question about it. I have failed people. Maybe not intentionally, but I have done it. But you know what? Let me tell you something. Jesus does not fail you. And if we stumble over a person in the natural who has failed us, we are very, very foolish. There is a scripture that has so helped me when I have felt Christians let me down. It's Hebrews 5.14. And it says, strong meat belongs to them who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. Strong meat. Everybody wants the strong meat of God's word if they're a believer. Ooh, you love that. But it says it belongs to those who have their senses exercised, those who have gone through life's experiences, and they ha know what is flesh and carnality, what is demonic, and what is God. And folks, you learn it by living. You learn it by practice. You learn it by exercise. And if we can't take the exercise, then we have no business doing it. You know, do you know what I'm saying? So all my experiences of going through maybe some disappointments just help me to get hold of the stronger meat of God's Word and to see that the good shepherd is the perfect shepherd and to keep my eyes on him. Because if you fall away because some human shepherds blew it and you miss the good shepherd, you will be deceived by the false shepherd. And that's the devil's tool. That is the devil's tool. Don't fall into that dumb trap. Okay, let's open it up. It says, Open thy doors, O Lebanon. And then it says that the fire may devour thy cedars. Now this is going down into a prophecy of the fall of Israel and the fall of Jerusalem in the time of the Roman invasion in 70 A.D. This is going into that timing. So let's keep that in mind. And it says, Howl, fir trees, because this is the way the people will howl, for the cedar is fallen. And the fir trees are the people, and the cedar is the temple. It will fall. People would come out of hiding when they saw the temple burning and literally throw themselves on the fire to put out the fire, thinking some way their own bodies could smother the fire. It was a terrible, terrible tri time. Howl, O ye oaks of Bashan, and Bashan were called in Psalms 22:12 the bulls of Bashan, the Pharisees who wanted Jesus crucified. And so these bulls of Bashan were the false prophets. Remember, it was verses 1 through, uh, false shepherds, verses 1 through 11 that we saw, these false shepherds. And they led the people astray because they did not lead them in godliness and righteousness, really led them into idolatry. It says, for the forest of the vintage is come down. All the fortified areas of Jerusalem are falling now. They're being penetrated and destroyed. And it says, the screams of leadership. There is a voice of howling of the shepherds. Oh, when this happens, the false shepherds that let their people down scream and howl. It is terrible. It is a hopeless situation. Hopeless situation. Now, basically, there were three kinds of leadership in Israel. 
in the year 70 AD. There were the religious leaders, which were the shepherds. There were the young lions, which were the political leaders. And then there were the flock, the individual leaders of the people. So this is the leadership that is being dealt with here in particular. For their glory is destroyed. I tell you, when that temple fell, that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so when that fell, see, all the Phariseeism, all of the junk went down the drain. All their legalism is gone. And it says, a voice of the roaring of young lions. Ah, now we said the shepherds were the religious leaders, but the young lions were the political leaders. So the political leaders, oh, they're screaming and crying out too. Oh, it is too late. For the pride of Jordan is destroyed. And so all the forms of authority are destroyed and plundered. There was, and there was civil war in the city. And the zealots rose up against the Sisari, S-I-C-A-R-I-I. -I. And Sisari came from a word meaning a sword. And these people tried to take, uh, uh, get the Romans out with the sword. And they were always in a fight back and forth with the Romans. And then the Zealots were the very religious Jews. And they began to fight with their Jewish brothers, the Sasari, that, you know, were in there with the sword trying to take hold of it. Couldn't do it. When Nebuchadnezzar, uh, not Nebuchadnezzar, when Rome besieged the city, they starved them to death. They ate rats. They chewed on belts. They did anything. They ate each other. Finally, in the year 70 A.D., they fell. And it said... History says that one million people were slaughtered and 97,000 people were taken into captivity. And many of them, I looked at what they would do, would work in salt mines or be the uh, gladiators and be destroyed in Rome. They would be used, you know, for the big Roman games that they had where they brought these people out and murdered them. They didn't care. They were their captives. Now, Jesus had warned them of this. And I'm quoting from Matthew 20, uh, 24, when he says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem, I'm sorry, I'm not quoting from that, I'm quoting from Luke. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the total destruction is near. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Judea is the southern part of it. And it says, For this, these are the days of vengeance. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. And so he said it will be a terrible time when this happens. Now when you look at this account, Luke, I was reading from Luke. But Matthew 24 gives an account that most people think are the same. But it is not. Matthew 24 has to do with Armageddon. And Luke has to do with the year 70 A.D. when the Romans took it. And Jesus said to them, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. And he warned them this was coming because they were getting ready to go into the fifth cycle of discipline, discipline in Leviticus 26. But they wouldn't take the warning. They wouldn't take the warning. What does God always do? God always sends grace before judgment comes. There was much preaching, much teaching. Jesus himself appeared to call them to repentance. But they did not repent. They crucified him. And so what is left for them but to go into captivity? Because that's what Leviticus 26 said. Finally, if you won't listen, you will go into captivity. So Titus came and surrounded the city. And these things that Luke tells us begin to come to pass and begin to happen. So Zechariah, you say, wow, he's hit another river of prophecy. Is prophesying about the fall of Jerusalem. Did God have any pity, any mercy on these people in this terrible siege of Rome in the year 70 A.D.? And that's 70 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Did he not care at all these were his people? Was it so down the drain there was no hope at all for them? Well, it doesn't say that. Because in verse 4 of chapter 11, it says, Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. Now, this is the group of people that are going to be slaughtered. But he said, feed them, feed them so that they can make some choices. Well, what do you feed Christians? What do you feed godly people? You feed them the Word. And here were the disciples after the death and resurrection of Jesus, feeding them, feeding them, feeding them the Word. Here was Paul feeding them, feeding them, feeding them the Word. But see, they weren't taking it. And it says, whose possessors slay them. Now, what happened is that the Jews, of course, were not only slain by the Romans, but some of the Jewish leaders 
were turncoat, and there was civil war. And they didn't even hold themselves guilty. They'd just sell each other. They were in such a miserable state. And see, when they refused Jesus, they opened totally for a spirit of deception to come upon them. And this is that generation. And then he said, For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. So he said, You know, I'm, my long suffering has gone long enough. They're going to go into captivity. They have been fed the word. They've been ministered. They've been warned. We read the account in Luke. Even Jesus warned them. But they ignored the warning. So he said, They're going to go. I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, say, saith the Lord. But lo, I will deliver the men, every one, into his neighbor's hand. And so then there was more civil fighting among them. So it wasn't just Rome sitting on the outside, but they began to get into fighting among themselves. And he said, I will feed the flock of the slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And he said, And I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bands. Now, I have a picture of these two staves that I want you to see, because these are the staves of a shepherd. And when you look at beauty, I looked it up, it has to do with grace. Beauty means grace. And the other stave has to do with bands or unity. And in order for a nation to hold together, it must have God's grace and unity. And if they can't hang together, they will fall apart. And so what is happening? They refused God's grace, so it broke their unity. When we accept God's grace, it keeps us in unity. Because not only do we receive grace, but we give grace to others. And these are the two things that a flock must have, grace and unity with one another. And folks, in our churches, and I believe among believers, when we fall out of it with each other, we get angry with each other, it's because we don't give grace to one another. Oh, we want grace for ourselves, but don't give it to somebody else. And that is not what brings the unity. And so we begin to bite and devour one another, and we break the unity, and then we break what God has. And God knew that was happening. When they refused the forgiveness of sins, the grace of Jesus Christ, then they didn't have the grace to forgive others. You know, I will never forget praying early one morning in our sanctuary, and the Lord dealt with me and asked me to forgive a certain person. I thought, oh God, I have forgiven that person so many times, maybe 400 times. I thought, Lord, why don't you deal with them? I'm tired of you dealing with me. Why do I always have to be the forgiving one? Why don't you just make them quit acting like this? Then I don't have to forgive them. And then the Lord just, and I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was like he impressed me and said, you have the gift of forgiveness. I thought, I do. I never noticed I had that gift. Where is it? And this is how he spoke to me, and he spoke it out of Ephesians. He said, how were you saved? I said, by grace. He said, and what did grace do? I said, my, my sins were forgiven. So he said, when you received grace, your sins were forgiven. So what does grace do? I said, it forgives sins. He said, do you have grace now? I said, yes. He said, so what does grace do? I said, it forgives sins. So he said, you have the gift to forgive because you got it when you receive my grace. Now you see, when I have that kind of grace, then I don't break unity with the believers because I have the grace to forgive them. See, it says, above all these things put on charity, where charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Grace has to do with God's love. Grace is God's love. And when we love someone, it covers up their weaknesses and their faults. And people will come to you and say, you know so-and-so and you know what they're doing? Yeah, I do. But I love them. Well, I know, but do you know how bad they are? Yeah, but I love them. What is it when you will protect your mate no matter what? Somebody will come to you and say, did you know your mate so-and-so and so-and-so? Well, I don't want you talking to me about them. Now, don't you say that. Why do you cover? Because you love them. Love covers a multitude of sins. And, but if you didn't love them, you'd say, you're right, and I don't like it either, and I'm about to walk out on them for it. And we break the unity. And so we break the home. We break the church. We break the kingdom. And these are the two things that are so important for a flock, grace and unity. And so that's what he is pointing out here. And when they broke and would not receive grace then they lost their unity because they did not only not receive it for themselves, but when they didn't receive it, then they have it, didn't have it to give to others. In verse 8, it says, Three shepherds will I also cut off in one month, and my soul loathes them, and their soul abhorred me. Who are these three shepherds? They are the prophets, they are the priests, and the kings, the leadership, their political leadership. God said, I'm going to cut all three kinds of leadership off. 
So this chapter really deals, as I told you at the very beginning, with the administration here, heavy duty. And God says, I'm going to judge them. I've had enough of them. Then he says, then said I, I will not feed you that that dieth. Let it die. This is kind of a natural food. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. He said, I won't even feed you. We talked about feeding spiritual food, but this is natural food. He said, there won't be anything to eat so that you will be eating one another. And so we see the breaking of the staff now. Look at verse 10. And I, the Lord, took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I'd made with all the people. So he said, I just took this staff and broke it and said, I'm not going to lead you as your shepherd anymore because you won't take my grace. Oh, that is terrible. So he broke his grace over Israel and let them be taken into captivity. And it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And so when they did that, he said to them, if you think good, if it is good in your eyes, if not forbear. So they weighed for my price, oh brother, 30 pieces of silver. Now they refused. He talks about these terrible, evil shepherds that they had over them. The priests, the prophets, the political leaders, and how terrible they were to them. But he said, I had another shepherd I sent you that had a band of grace and a band of unity for you. And you wouldn't receive him. And what did you do? You sold him for 30 pieces of silver. You say, Marilyn, we are into the second shepherd. That's right. We're into the second shepherd. And he said, I sent that shepherd to you. And you refused him. You sold him into crucifixion. And he said, now I am breaking I'm breaking it. Remember how that breakdown was? Verses 1 through 11, the false shepherds. Verses 12 through 14, the good shepherd. And verses 15 through 17, the idle shepherd. So he said, no, I'm, I'm breaking it. I'm breaking my grace with you. Because what did you do? You sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. See, 30 pieces of silver was the price they pray, paid for a bull that had been gored. You know, it was a cheapy thing. 30 pieces of silver. So they said, here is a bull. Would you like to, to buy him? And they'd say, this, he's been gored, but, you know, for 30 pieces you can get him. And Jesus was gored for us, wasn't he? They pierced his side. They pierced his side. And he was sold like a gored animal. That was the price they paid for him. That is so terrible. And so we say, we can't buy Jesus. You know, he was sold for us. But we can never buy him back. We would never have the money to put up to buy him back. We can only believe that he died for us in faith. And that's how he becomes our good shepherd. And the Lord said unto me, Cast this under the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Wow. You say, this is Judas. Yes, it is. This is Judas selling our good shepherd. That's right, for 30 pieces of silver. This is the field that Judas is going to die in and that they are going to take the 30 pieces of silver because he brought it back and threw it in their faces and they're going to bury the poor there. This is the potter's field. And so you say, this came out of Zechariah. See why I tell you these prophets are so important? How can you understand New Testament if you don't have the shadow of it in the Old Testament, see, the sh shadow is old, the substance is new. And you put these things together and you say, wow, we. And the Lord is dealing with the Jews. This isn't the church. The church hasn't rejected him. The church isn't even in yet. This is the Jew that has rejected him. Now, what happened? It was called the field of blood. See, Judas loved money more than anything in his life. More than he loved Jesus, he loved money. And so he sold blood for money. Then he hung himself and fell into that field, and his blood was sprinkled all over that. And that's why this potter's field was called the field of blood, because he is the one who betrayed Jesus like a gourd animal, the price of a gourd animal. And Jesus is priceless, and we receive him by faith. So today I want to look at chapter 11 again, because it is such an important chapter. And I think we just have to key in on it and finish it up 
And remember, it has three shepherds in it. In verses 1 through 11, it has the false shepherds, are the apostate leaders. In verses 12 through 14, it has the good shepherd, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verses 15 through 17, it has the idle shepherd, which is the Antichrist. So if you said, well, what is the theme of chapter 11 of Zechariah? I could tell you the three shepherds, the three shepherds, and it contrasts them. So it jumps ahead. Now watch closely. It jumps ahead and goes down into an end time, goes down to Rome, the Roman time, when Judah was taken into captivity because of Rome. So now we see Zechariah moving into a prophecy that is way beyond what was in his day. Because when we see him open up to the ten visions at the beginning of it, those visions primarily had to do with the rebuilding of the temple. But now we're going down to a much, much future temple. We're seeing the destruction of the temple that they built in the day, year 70 A.D., when Titus comes in from Rome and leads his army against them. We're going to go all the way down to the millennial temple. So we get quite a picture of the temple, don't we? Here he raised up and said, come on, let's get this temple finished. But then we see Jesus teaching in this temple. We see this temple destroyed by Rome. But we see a new temple and the millennium, millennium being brought forth. So he didn't just exhort his people of his day. He exhorts us. He's exhorted the people of every day. And he is telling the Jews that they have a future. You know, the enemy always says to us, you have no future. Your children have no future. Well, laugh at the devil because the seed of the righteous shall be delivered and your children do have a future. You say, well, what if they're not saved? You know what I would say? Some member of our staff said this to me. When people ask her if her son is saved, she said he is soon to be saved. He's not saved now, but he is soon to be saved. And that's the way I like to talk about people. Soon to be saved if they're not born again. So this is a very, very encouraging chapter, again, showing us the integrity of God's Word. Now it opens up, and let's remember, now this is in the day of the temple, after Jesus died and rose from the dead. This is the same temple they were going to build, but of course it is beautified by Herod, you know, in Herod's day. So we're looking at a temple over 500 years old at this time, but one that has been beautified, enlarged, added to, one that Jesus came in and taught. But now we're seeing it ripped to the ground. And in verse 1, he says, Open your doors, O Lebanon. And of course, this is the door opening of the temple to Rome coming in to destroy the temple. That the fire may devour thy cedars. And of course, the cedars has to do with the temple. The fire will literally devour the temple. And then it says, Howl for trees. And this is the screams of the people as they see their temple being destroyed. And it said that they were so disturbed that many people, now the history says this, the Jews would go in and throw themselves on the flames and literally be burned alive. Oh, that is just tragic. Then he says, How scream ye, O ye oaks of Bashan. Now, Bashan, Bashan, you say, what can that mean? Well, if we would go to Psalms 22, it talks about the bulls of Bashan who helped crucify Christ. Bashan has to do with the Pharisees, the legalistic believers. And so he said, you're going to howl because of it. And it says, the forest of the vintage is come down, which means all of the fortified places that they had were being ripped down. And there is a voice of howling and screaming of the shepherds. The religious leaders are screaming and howling. It is such agony to them to see what is going on. And it says, their glory is destroyed, all their wealth, all their ritual, this temple that they have absolutely worshipped all these years is going to the ground. Then it says the voice or the screaming of the young lions. And we see that these uh, pictures of animals give, are the symbols of who the leadership are. And the young lions are the political leaders. Oh, they are so disturbed. They are so distraught. Because these people were so deceived. You know, I think here Jesus himself comes to preach to them. And what do they do? They crucify him. He told them this was going to happen. They ignored him. And so there's a terrible thing with the religious leaders, with the political leaders. And it says the pride of Jordan is destroyed. And there comes a civil war between the zealots and the moderates, the Sakari, those that wanted to take up the sword and to really uh, put Rome out. And those who said, no, we shouldn't do anything. 
and they burn the grain supply. They get in a big fight, and history says they burn the grain supply, and then that put the people into a state of starvation. They ate rats, they chewed on belts, you know, it was pitiful. And when Titus finally took the city, he slaughtered over a million of the Jewish people. And I read where 97,000 survivors were taken as slaves of the Roman government. Some of them were gladiators and used for the sports in Rome, and some were used in the salt mines. So it was a pitiful, t pitiful time. Now, in Luke 21, verses 20 through 24, now, Luke 21 gives an account that sounds very similar to Matthew 24. Now, this is my opinion. I believe that Luke 21 has to do with this account of the fall in Rome, of the Roman captivity coming against Judah, Jerusalem, that Jesus prophesied. I believe Matthew 24 is the Armageddon destruction. So are you getting the difference? Because I just kind of raced through this in this session before. Put your hand on your heart. So I won't forget, Luke 21 has to do with the fall of Jerusalem in the day of Rome. Matthew 24 has to do with the fall of Jerusalem in Armageddon. Okay, now see, if we can see the difference, I think it will help us. Now let's just read what Luke says. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, and of course these are the Romans in the year 70 A.D., then let them which are in Judea, and that means the southern part, not just Jerusalem, but Judea, to flee to the mountains. And this, of course, is what it, a similar thing will happen in the tribulation when the Antichrist arises and they will flee, you know. Then it says, For these are the days of vengeance, and that all these things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon the people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. And we know that they fell. Over a million people fell. And when Armageddon hits, there will be millions and millions of people, you know, that will be killed at that time. Now, what had God done? For 600 years, he's given them a warning that this is going to happen. Because Zechariah writes this 600 years before it happens. So, and then Jesus came and warned them again. In that 600 years, we have five cycles of discipline going on. Each prophet, you know, tried to call them to repentance. Each prophet probably dealt with a different cycle of, di of uh, repentance and discipline. But when Jesus came, he came at the fifth cycle of repentance and said, there's, there's nothing left. If you don't repent, you will go into captivity. And so he is one of those cycles of discipline. And imagine God warning that this would happen and giving a very graphic picture of it 600 years before it happened. You know who doesn't want you to read the whole Bible, know the whole Bible? I can tell you who it is. It's Satan. Because there is such integrity in the Word that we say, hey, if this is true, then the rest is true. And that's why it's important to know the whole Bible. And they said, whose possessors slay them. And, of course, these are the Jews. And these are the Jewish leaders. And, of course, the last that comes upon the scene is that Jesus himself warned them. And it says, and they hold themselves not guilty. They sell them and say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. So the Jews did not pity the inhabitants at all. They were cruel to them. You know, but in all of the bad news of this 11th chapter of Zechariah, God always brings good news. Because he said, I will feed the flock of the slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. In all of this time of the judgment that's coming upon them, there were people who were teaching them the word. You see, the Christians were there. Jesus had been there. They had the apostles, the disciples, the born-again Christians. They had been teaching them. And history tells us that the Christians knew when Rome was, go uh, Rome was going to come in and cause Jerusalem to fall, and they fled to Edom, Ammon, and Moab, and were safe in that time that, that many Christians did not go into slavery because the Spirit of the Lord spoke to them and they knew differently. So they were fed. Then he said, I took unto me two staffs, the one I called beauty and the other I called bands. Now these are always pictures for us. So when we get pictures, the reason God gives us pictures is we understand better in pictures and we remember better in pictures than we do in words. So God gives words and pictures and that's why we've just had some simple pictures 
on, on this whole Zechariah teaching to help you understand the book better. So here are the two staffs that a shepherd must have in order for his flock to, uh, flock to be complete. Get all these words right. For all of his flock to be complete. Now the first staff was called beauty or grace and the other staff was called unity. Now when Jesus came as the good shepherd to the Jews before their fall by Rome, he brought grace to them. I mean he brought grace to them and gave them a time to repent. But they did not accept his grace. And so because they refused grace, they would receive judgment. So the staff is broken. And now when that staff is broken, Rome can come in and take them. Till that time, Rome couldn't. Then unity. You see, there has been beautiful unity where people have grace. They receive grace. They give grace. We studied this in our last session. If you refuse grace for yourself, you don't give grace to others. You know, folks, when we're hard and legalistic with people, it's usually because we have not received the forgiveness we need to have. And I've noticed Christians that are very harsh on others usually have something they're trying to hide, and they feel that God would treat them that way, and so they treat others that way. But if they would repent and get His grace, then what would they want to give to others? What they've received, grace. So the grace is broken. When the grace is broken, the unity is broken. There is no unity without the grace of God. Very short-term unity, but no grace. And so the unity is broken, and I'm going to tell you, they begin to fight among each other. We see the Cesari, the Zealots, we see the Moderates, we see the Prophets, the Priests, the Leadership selling one another, eating each other. Oh, I mean, it is awful. It is so bad. And so these two staffs are broken. Now we're still looking, remember, at these shepherds, these political shepherds and religious shepherds that they had, because we go on through verse 11. Then said I, I will not feed you that that, that dieth, lest it die. And that that to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. And so what happened is when the staffs were broken, they literally had such disunity. They burned, somebody burned up all of the grain and they began to eat their own children, kill each other. And it said, And I, the Lord, took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. And see, when that covenant was cut asunder, then the Gentiles could come in and take them, and that was the Romans. And it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. So they knew that it had been prophesied by Jesus that not one stone would be left upon the other. And that Jesus had said, just like a hen gathers her chicks, I would have gathered you, but you wouldn't listen. Then he said, and he begins here, that in verse 12 and 13 and 14, he begins to show the true shepherd. We see the false shepherds, human, human false shepherds. Now we see Jesus, the good shepherd. And I said unto them, if you think good, if you think good, give me my price. What is the price to have the good shepherd? It's not money, it's faith. You know, people say to me sometimes, I didn't think getting saved would be so easy. I said, why didn't you? They said, I thought I would have to do something. And I found out that Jesus did it all for me. And so I simply believe on what he did for me. And that's exactly right. If you did it, you'd take the credit for it. But he did it all. So you have to rest on, on faith, in faith, in his finished work at Calvary for you individually. You have to believe that he died in your place. He did it all. You received the finished work of Christ. So the, he said, this is my prize, faith in Christ. And said, if not, if you won't receive it by faith, if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And of course, this is always the picture of rejection because Judas rejected Christ sold him for 30 pieces of silver. We found out it's the price of a slave gored by a bull. And Jesus was gored in his side. They pierced his side. And he was sold for the price of someone who was pierced and gored. Oh, it is such a picture of Jesus Christ. And he did it for money. Judas betrayed him for that money. The priceless one he betrayed. And then he went back to them. We know more of the picture of this in the New Testament. And isn't the Bible like a big puzzle? And the more you read it through and read it through, then you get a little piece here, and then you get another little piece here, another little piece here, and it begins to go together. You begin to get the outline and the corners of it. And so we see this puzzle beginning to come together. 
And we say now, Judas was the one who betrayed him. And the Lord said unto me, Cast is it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized of, of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Do you realize this prophecy was written in 518 B.C. and it came to pass in 30 A.D.? So it was written 550 years before it occurred and told the price that Judas would betray Jesus for and the field that would be bought, it would be a potter's field. In Acts uh, 1, 18 and 19, it was called the field of blood. And the potter's field, the field of blood, they bought with the money because Judas felt so guilty afterwards and so condemned. He came and took the money and threw it in their faces. They said, this is blood money. So they went out and bought a field called blood, the field of blood, and it was a potter's field where potters went and took clay to make pots. And they said, the poor don't have the money to bury, you know, buy a burial place, so we will use this for the poor. And I thought, my, my, Judas loved money more than he loved anything in life, so he was willing to sell Jesus like a gourd slave. And then we know that he hung himself over this field, and the rope broke, and he fell because it was evidently a sloping field and he fell and his body was crushed and you know all of he did well his whole body was crushed and blood went every place and that was another reason why it was called that then I cut asunder mine other staff even bands unity that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel and so he said you see they could have had unity with me but I broke the second staff and there is no unity between them and no unity with me and you know, folks, I don't really think we can have unity with others unless we have peace with God. Because if we don't have the peace, we have peace with God, and then we have the peace of God so that we can have peace with others. Sometimes we have peace with God, but we don't take the peace of God, so we don't have peace with others. And that's the picture here of the Good Shepherd. Now here comes the Antichrist, ugh, the idle shepherd. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. Now, the foolish shepherd here is called the serpent, the willful king, the false prophet, the beast. He is called uh, the idle shepherd, he that eats the flesh of the fat. This is, he is called the Antichrist. So we get many, many names of him. You say, why so many names? Because each name gives a different attribute of his behavior and how he is. Why does God tell us that? Because he doesn't want us to be ignorant of it. He doesn't want us to be ignorant. What is truth? Truth is God's word. And he says, For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall uh, not visit those that be cut off. See, the wicked shepherd, the Antichrist rises up. He doesn't visit anybody. All he wants is for himself. So now we see the contrast of the idle shepherd and the good shepherd. Neither shall he seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken nor feed that that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd. And you know, when you look at Jesus, you say, does he seek out the young? Oh, yes. Didn't Jesus minister to the children? Didn't he say, suffer them to come unto me? Didn't he love the children? Oh, yes. Didn't he heal that was broken? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the brokenhearted. Didn't he feed that that standeth still? Didn't he take the loaves and the fish and multiply them because he knew the people were hungry? Didn't he feed them in the natural? But see, not the Antichrist. He doesn't feed that that stands still, and he eats the flesh of the fat and tears their claws in pieces. Jesus never tore up people. He came to men, people. Folks, when you follow Satan, you follow the one who is the destroyer and the murderer. And if you're a backslidden Christian today, I would strongly suggest before the end of this program that you recommit your life to Jesus Christ because you are following a wrong shepherd, an idle shepherd, who will rip you up and eat your flesh and leave you with nothing. But Jesus loves you and he will take nothing and he will make something. Turn to Jesus. You know, chapter 12, basically gives the tribulational siege of Jerusalem. So we saw the siege of Rome, you know, Rome coming upon them in chapter 11. Now he takes us, Zechariah takes us all the way down to the end of the tribulation and we see the siege of Jerusalem then. So we are really involved with three sieges of Jerusalem in this book. 
because he looks back to when Jerusalem was taken by Babylon and the people were taken into captivity. He looks ahead to the time when Rome would take them into captivity in the year 70 A.D., which we would look back to, but he's prophesying ahead to it, 550 years ahead. And then what does he do? He, God takes him up to another mountain peak of prophecy in chapter 12 and goes way down to the end of the tribulation, which you see is going to be like 2,000 years later, and shows how Jerusalem will become besieged by many, many nations of the world and will be surrounded with them. And at that time, at the, it looks like it's the most desperate time of all, Jesus will appear upon the scene and they will behold him whom they have pierced. Oh, it is really something else. All right. Now, when we look at this book, we will see that there is a real important phrase that kind of goes throughout it. I say this book, this chapter, excuse me. Chapter 12 has a real important phrase, and that phrase is, in that day. Say it. In that day. In verse 3, verse 4, verse 6, verse 8, verse 9, verse 11, it says, in that day. In that day. In that day. What is this day? Ooh, this is the day of the Lord. This is referred to, and I'm just going to give you, read some references that I wrote down. I didn't write every one of them down, but I wanted you to see how important it is since it is used so much in chapter 12. But it is referred to in Isaiah 13, 9 and 10. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy sinners therefore out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall uh, not cause her light to shine. In that day, you said, that's tribulation. That's right. But it's the end of tribulation. It's the time when these armies gather around Jerusalem. It looks like Israel will fall. This is going to be a very, very dark day. Joel 2, 10 and 11 refers to it. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? So you say, this doesn't sound like a good day. No, this is a very bad day because God is bringing judgment upon the enemies of Israel. Here's another one. This is in Joel 3, 15. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. See, folks, we can't just take one scripture. We have to see how they come together here. We've got a lot of witnesses about this day. Amos 5:18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. You say, man, everything here is darkness, no light. That's right. And we're going to see where it turns totally dark for 24 hours later in this book. Ezekiel 32, 7. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. Revelation 6, 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. You say, it's really going to get dark on this day. That's right. And folks, the references I have read to you, here's the last one I'll read, Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. So do you think this is true? You say, yeah, it is going to be a day of darkness, and we will even see it more when we go to Zechariah 14, when it says, and it shall, 6, and it shall come to pass that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. There just won't be any light. It will be dark. Now, 12 is, is telling that the day of the Lord is the day when the Lord comes down to judge the enemies of Jerusalem. The burden, I'm opening up the chapter now, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. So God says, I have a burden because I'm the one who made the heavens, the earth, and man. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. You know, there was an old saying, they called it a lodestone mountain or lodestone. And ancient mariners said that, you know, when they would be in a, a ship 
sailing by a shore, maybe sailing around a piece of land, that if the Lodestone Mountain was there, no matter what the tides were, no matter how they would try to row the ship, that that lodestone had a magnetic, magnetic force that would pull them to the shore and cause the ship to shipwreck on the shore. So lodestone mountain, you know, they just, they just had a story about it. It was a lodestone that would pull them where they didn't want to go. Now, really what basically is happening is Jerusalem is becoming a lodestone. It is pulling Russia. It is pulling Africa and nations, Egypt, around them and pulling them together around Israel to gather around Jerusalem to besiege them and wipe them out. Because God said, if I can get all the enemies in one place, I can just do the whole thing at one shot. <laughs> so we see that God is drawing them into this place. You know, why do we think God is caught so unaware? He said, I'll just get them all in one place and take care of the thing. And, and I'll save the Jews while I'm doing it. They'll see me, the one whom they've pierced. Did you ever notice how God gets so much mileage out of one thing? Man, he gets a lot of mileage out of it. All right, now he says, I'll pull them there. In that day will I make Jerusalem. Now here we have the first in that day in this chapter. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Say so it will become a burden for them for coming to Jerusalem, for being drawn here. Because when they come around here, I'm going to cut them up. I'm disgusted with what they have done through the years. So God is saying, I am drawing in them into this place, and I'm going to bring judgment on them. Now, that was verse 3, in that day. Here comes verse 4, in that day. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blind, blindness. Now, he said, when they bring their weapons down here to fight against Jerusalem, they'll fall apart on them. You know, like the wheels of the chariots that came after the Jews when they were fleeing from Pharaoh. Remember, he said God took the wheels of the chariots off while they were passing through the Red Sea, and the chariots fell apart. Well, that's what's going to happen. The weapons that they bring are going to fall apart. They won't work. And I, th this is personal opinion, I think angels are going to come down there and rip on their equipment, and it will not work. I think it's angels that came and pulled the wheels of the chariots off of the Pharaoh's army as they were chasing the Israelites when they left Egypt on the floor of the Red Sea. And so he said, I'll smite their horses with astonishment. They'll be confused. Their riders will go crazy. I'll open my eyes on the house of Judah and smite every horse of the people with blindness. I'll be looking at Judah, but even these weapons cannot go any place because I'll close the eyes of the horses. Because what's going to happen? He's going to fight with the enemies.